friends, Dave Politis, Scanning and Missing Project, copyrighted edition for our video page channel. This is Huck, the executive producer of the news and of the missing person segment. And she just wants some loving. She's a good girl. Yeah, she's a good girl. She goes, Dad, don't stop. I like it when you scratch my head. Oh, look at that. Yeah, it's a good girl. Yeah, so Huck's gonna hang out, make sure I'm doing everything right, and uh, I'm gonna tick you into a missing person segment, <clears throat> and one that uh, is gonna wake a few people up. Now this is a two-part segment. I'm thinking about making one real long one, but I've done that before, and everyone fades away after about 20 minutes. I know, I'll get people saying, oh yeah, no, no, we stay for the full hour. Well, this will be two segments. And it's going to involve something I've never, ever talked about before. Missing truck drivers. And about a month ago, we got onto a series of unusual events. And with some things that have happened just lately, it started to put us into gear and we said, you know, we're going to really take a hard look at this and we ended up where we are today. And uh, I'm going to uh, talk about two of those cases today. Now, first of all, I think truck drivers are some of the least appreciated of our labor pool. And the reason I say that is because everything, everything you get at a store is brought by truck. And it seems like kind of a boring job to some people, but uh, I've met a few truck drivers over the years and some of them really like it. I think it depends your style. Do you like driving cross country? Do you like driving short routes? There's all kinds of truck drivers. Driving from New York to California. There's other truck drivers that drive for Walmart, say, and drive in between Walmarts all kinds of options and the people we're going to talk to you about in these two episodes kind of are a variety some long some short but there's a couple consistencies here that you're going to be able to pick up real quick number one if you've ever read missing 411 a sobering coincidence you're ahead of the game not that these cases are in there but you'll understand the basics behind what I'm going to tell you. There's people who have written that have said that my cases are not unusual and that there's an explanation for everything. <laughs> so that topic got brought up at a dinner with some friends one time. And my friends just started laughing. I said, Dave, whoever said that obviously never read your books, never watched your movies. And if they did, have these people ever challenged you on your facts? No. <laughs> and the best example is what I'm going to start to tell you today. And I'll finish at, finish at the end of the next session. And I'll make them back-to-back -back sessions so it'll kind of stay continuous. Now, the first case I'm going to kick off with, and the only case in the two days that is a case I've talked about before, if you've stayed tuned. There's some new evidence in it, and it's the best bedrock case to start this with. It's, it involves a man from India. Actually, his family's from India. A man named Satwant Baines. 54 years old. Went missing May 15th. Well, Huck, did you want to go out? Okay. There you go. Be a good girl. Disappeared. Oh yeah, thank you, Huck. Gotta love that. So that one disappeared May 15th, 2019. In an area I know really, really well. So this is Hollister, California, right over here. Barely see it. And this is 152. 152 is a cutoff 
that everybody from San Jose that wants to go to LA comes down into Morgan Hill, cuts across on 152, and then takes the I-5 south. I-5 is the major, inter, uh, major highway in California through the San Joaquin Valley. It's high speed, like 70 miles an hour. Everyone goes 80, 85. But I-5 is just a north-south route through California. And right where that orange marking is, that's where this incident happened. Right adjacent to the biggest reservoir in that area for miles and miles and miles around. Keep that in mind. I've always said all of my cases, directly or indirectly, relate to water. Now, Salwant was a truck driver from Fowler, California, which is a, a valley town south of Fresno. His family described him as being super dedicated dad, father, uncle, <coughs> loved the family life, loved his job, been a truck driver for 20 plus years. Family said he was never late, extremely punctual. Well, on May 13th, he left home, said goodbye to his family for a scheduled delivery to Fairfield, California. Now, it was never made public what he was delivering. Just so you know, I'm not trying to hide anything or hold anything. I, I tried to find it and I couldn't. Now, his family also said that Satwant was a diabetic and needed medication. So something I've talked about many times with the cases I'm missing 411, there's always something, or a lot of times, there's something else involved. He left on May 13th. May 15th, he left on May 13th, May 15th, 4.30 a.m. The California Highway Patrol gets a call of a big rig stopped in the northbound lane of I-5 at the Whitworth exit. They said it was partially in the northbound lane. That's, that's dangerous, so they send a CHP officer out, gets there about 5 a.m. And what he finds is the truck partially in that lane, something truckers would never do. CHP walked around the rig, nobody around, engine still running, doors unlocked. <clears throat> he get, opens the door and inside he sees a cell phone and a wallet. Opens a wallet, finds the name of Satwan Baines. CHP goes through communications, has them call, calls the relatives. They said, that's very, very, very strange. She's supposed to be by now up in Fairfield making the delivery. Hmm. CHP calls the owner of the truck. Don't know. They never made that public either. And asks them to check the truck status, where it should be, blah, blah, blah. Owner comes back and says, yeah, she's supposed to be further nor in Northern California delivering. Well, the truck had GPS on it, which a lot of trucks do these days because of them being stolen. GPS on the truck showed that just after midnight on the 15th, it had pulled over to the side of the road and stopped. Well, that night, <clears throat> CHP contacts... Uh, search and rescue, contacts Merced County Sheriff's, and contacts their own helicopter unit for a call out the next morning. Obviously they're missing somebody, local restaurants were checked. There's not a lot in that area within walking distance. Well, that morning, May 16th, early in the morning, the CHP helicopter for that region landed, met with search and rescue organizers from uh, Merced County, who had also brought in search and rescue and extra CHP units. CHP units were going to walk and drive the highway, thinking of the possibility, hey, maybe that one got hit by a car, dragged, thrown over the side of the road, something. But they knew something really weird was, on, was up because it wasn't in his personality to do this. 
they also called the family again and they wanted to know what his what his personality was like when he left and they said he was ecstatically happy everything was great had no issues in life this was a normal routine thing nothing outside the, the norm well the chp searched the highways from ground level and above and merced county started to walk the region outside the fences of the highway nothing local restaurants nothing may 17th merced county dive team was called and placed in the mendota canal which this this may be strange to some people in some areas but this area there's the mendota canal which runs along the highway here and it's a canal that runs all year now you can't get to that canal by just walking over it's got two fences barbed wire fence i mean it, it's no easy thing to get to folks but obviously in merced county deputies had locks they brought in their team and they started walking the canal looking thinking where else are they going to look well chp also flew the canal for miles in both directions found nothing so now what are you thinking you're the sheriff the only thing really left to do is to put divers in the water of the canal and maybe search the reservoir that's nearby. So May 18th, they put <clears throat> divers in the water, divers walking the bank. There is a flow in the canal and it's kind of a dangerous thing. I've known people that have worked that canal area before. It's kind of dangerous because you just sometimes you just can't crawl out of it. That's Huck Parker. Two miles downstream from the truck at 2 p.m. on May 18th, one of the deputies walking along sees something strange in the water, calls over the divers. It's sat one. It's his body. They, uh, they pull the body out of the water and it's removed and it's sent to the corner. Now for sat one, to get to the canal is his vehicle is facing northbound. The canal is on the west side of the highway. He would have had to have crossed two high speed lanes northbound, go through a gully, cross two high speed lanes southbound on I-5, jump over a fence, walk 50 feet, get to a barbed wire fence, go over the top of that, then go in the water. You'd think somebody would have saw that if that happened. Well, the CHP stated that they had a possible witness, no guarantees, that possibly saw Satwant walking around his rig with its rig's lights flashing. Now, first of all, it's very, very doubtful that it was him because there's a lot of trucks that pull over the guys get tired etc they check their loads they move on but maybe it was who knows his family made a statement that he was a 25 year truck driver extremely diligent he had no mental health issues but he was diabetic he disappears after midnight because they confirmed that the truck stopped just after midnight. He ends up drowned in the only water in the area, adjacent to a dam with the only dam in the area. Think about how ludicrous this all sounds. Sounds stupid, doesn't it? Well, hold your taters because I got more. Now, I first stole, told that story to you about two years ago. And as you will see, as we move along, the relationship between all these. Next case involves another truck driver, uh, truck driver named Surat Nunum. 
Noonham. Missing March 16th, 2012. Well, missing about seven years before Satwant disappeared. Now, he was from New Hampshire. This is the best picture I could come up with for Surratt. He's from New Hampshire, and he was taking a load to Gary, Indiana. Very experienced truck driver, very diligent, very trusted. Not a screw up kind of person. Well, March 15th, 7 p.m. Before I go any further, let me show you. This is where this incident happened. Now, if I could put a dot on any map anywhere and put it in amongst the bodies of water where they have the most disappearances, dead center between this one, this one, and this one, Great Lakes. That's it. That is it. I couldn't make this up. Now, he's, he pulls into with his big rig, and not every hotel can handle a big rig, but this one did, Three, March 15th at 7 p.m. He checks into the Ramada Inn in Holiday City, Ohio. Yes, not a, not a huge location by any means, but this is the exit and the location of the Ramada Inn. The Ramada Inn is no longer there. It has a different name, but that's where it was located. The clerk said everything seemed normal. He was fine, happy, checks in, goes to his room. The next day, March 16th, at about one o'clock in the afternoon, the Williams County Sheriff is contacted by Stewart's employer saying he missed a delivery. Hmm. So the deputies responded to the hotel where the owner of the truck knew he had stopped and they found the semi truck parked appropriately in the lot. Deputies checked out the truck, nothing unusual. Deputies go to the hotel, talk to the manager, they let him into the room and all of Surratt's property, everything seems normal. Like someone checked in, maybe took a nap, maybe the bed was slept in, there was no mention. So they contact the family and the family said that they hadn't heard from them the night before. Now, moving forward, the deputies eventually contacted the cell phone company and found that Surratt had tried to make a call just after midnight on March 16th. So they confirmed that the day he had to have disappeared would be March 16th, the day the deputies went to the hotel. Now at 4 p.m. that day, the deputies call for canine units to respond to the scene, and they're given some of Surratt's clothes from his room. Well, the canines circle the hotel, circle the pond, walk around the trails, walk around the hotel. They're not picking up any anything unusual, no scent trail. The Williams County Sheriff then calls the local life flight and asks if they would fly over the area. They said, no problem. They lifted off, they flew for two hours, flew a radius of six miles over agricultural fields, the pond, the hotel, adjacent roadways, look and see, maybe he got hit, and banged off the road, nothing. Late that day, the sheriff made a decision that they've got to go back and search that area again the next day. March 17th, canines return to the scene and they get the first go right at the first scent to see if they can pick something up. Deputies went through the big rig again and they had ground pounders, people on foot that were walking the area around the hotel, on the roadway, trying to understand and trying to piece together what is going on here. They talked to the hotel, Again, the hotel says nothing unusual. They got the names of people who stayed in an adjacent room to see if they heard anything. Nothing heard, nothing unusual. Blood was looked for in the hotel room, no blood. They were at a dead end. Well, <clears throat> March 19th, more searchers 
wider radius, meaning they're pushing out further. No clues. Deputies were baffled. Again, they explained that Surratt was your classic, trustworthy, good truck driver. Never was late. Long history of successful engagements. Family said he was a great man. Everyone's baffled. Sheriff has a meeting at the end of the day on the 19th with his people. And they said that the only thing that they haven't really gone through yet is the pond on the property. So March 20th, about five days after Surratt disappears, the sheriff's office has the canines come back out, walk the perimeter, they get no scent trail. And then they put three divers in the water. Now this is not a big pond. And they're using super advanced side scan radar to look at the bottom. I have been on boats, search and rescue boats, that have side scan radar. Side scan is unbelievable technology. Unbelievable. And in Missing 411, The Hunted, we actually worked with a professional man and his wife that had recovered dozens of bodies. And we went out with him on a lake and he explained how it all worked. And he showed us what the bottom looks like. It's, you can see everything, everything. Well, the three divers worked the side scan up and down. They did a grid pattern on the lake. Later on that day, Sheriff Kevin Beck from the Sheriff's Office was interviewed about what happened on the, on the pond. And he said, well, we saw some very nice fish, but there's nothing down there. Okay, that clears the pond. The next day, the Sheriff's Office announced that they were going to terminate the search. They had no place else to look. Body's not in the pond. Body's not in the fields. Not in the room. Not in the truck. Where else are you going to look? They did the right thing. Now, 24 days later, May 7th, 2012. Fishermen are at this pond. Well, remember what the sheriff said, there's some nice fish in the pond. Well, apparently fishermen had gone to that pond many times and they can always had gone to that pond. But this time, fishermen go to the pond and they see something in the pond that they think is unusual. And they didn't want to say exactly what it was, but they thought it might be a body. So they call the sheriff's office. Same deputies that have been searching and looking for a Surratt come out to the pond. They get over there, they look down, and yeah, it looks like a body. Well, they pull it out, <clears throat> and in the hip pocket of the body is Surratt's ID. Body was eventually removed at 8.07 p.m. on May 7th. And the body was taken to the Lucas County Morgue for autopsy. Well, Williams County, not a huge county. And these counties oftentimes contract with other counties and their coroners or their medical examiners to do autopsies. That's what happened here. May 9th, the coroner made a statement that death was not caused by homicide but it was drowning. Hmm. Okay. Case over. We'll see you later. And that's what everybody does in these cases. You have to be a critical thinker here, folks. And that isn't the end of the story. Because on November 21st, 2012, there was a follow-up article and they interviewed Deputy Dennis Wisniewski, a 30-year 30 <coughs> 30 Sheriff's Department dive team member. And they were interviewing him specifically about Surratt's case. 
And they said, what went wrong out there? How did you miss that body? And he says, we don't know. Quote, it bothers me a lot. He said it wasn't the first time we'd used a side scan, sonar, but we're total, quoting, we're totally baffled. We don't know what went wrong. I get that. And I appreciate the honesty and straightforwardness from Wozniewski. <coughs> A lot of times, people associated with the sheriff's office are very controlled. They don't want to be embarrassed. They don't want to admit they made a mistake. Deputy Wozniewski, I don't think you made a mistake. I don't think you did anything wrong. I'll say it right here. I don't think the body was in the pond. But imagine 24 days until anybody had seen that body. Yet there were fishermen there all the time. Body should have come up after four or five days. It didn't. And imagine, uh, what's the best description I can give you? Imagine looking and watching TV and you're watching a show where they have an underwater camera looking at the bottom of the ocean. Friends, if you animated that, so it kind of looks like animation, which is what the side scan looks like. But you see everything. You see everything in the water. You see things floating. You see things below. I don't know how you would miss anything. So in short, he didn't miss it. Those three deputies didn't miss it. But what is it about truckers? Is it they're alone? Now, it just so happens that these two men that I told you about were foreign descent. Satwan, Indian. Nunum, Surat Nunum. I don't want to make any guesses. I'm sure you people out there recognize the name and the country that he'd be from. But I think the facts in these two cases are pretty darn close. Both truckers, both alone, both somehow got into water, not water you'd swim in, not water you'd drink. Both of them diligent, hardworking men What happened? Well, Surat was 48, Satwant 54. Pretty close in age, too. One happened in California, one happened in Ohio. Now, I'm going to march you down this path some more in the next session. This is something that never has been discussed as far as I know by anybody. But after now I lay this path, it's going to be, everyone will be talking about it. But the point being, you're going to get blown away in the next session. And you're going to see what I mean. And what possibly may be involved. In the meantime, please share this video everywhere you can. Let the truck drivers in the world know we appreciate them. They're good people. And something unusual is happening out there. In the meantime, do something nice for people if you see them in the community. Be kind to people. Remember, it's a kindness revolution. It doesn't hurt to smile. I appreciate all of you. Play us out.